Hello, everybody. This is the Chinyo Maji Podcast with Impact Africa Network. Uh, very excited this week. Uh, we have, we're continuing on our female founder kind of uh, uh, winning uh, format here. Um, we have Ella. And Ella, I struggle with you saying your last My name. My last name, Painovich. Painovich. So yes. we have Ella Painovich. Uh, I, former, are you still with the company? You're what? I am. I'm an owner and a board member of... and. Co-founder, which is what you're getting at, of Soko. Soko, yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to misrepresent like where you are in that stage, but yeah, uh, <coughs> formerly co-founder of Soko, still co-founder of Soko. Timeline, but um, yeah, uh, super excited to have you here. You and I have been kind of talking about a lot of things, and um, you know, so thanks for taking the time to actually be here. I know it's a bit of a daunting kind of scenario like we've talked about already but yes yeah so tell us a little bit more about you know your background you know um, where you come from um, and how you ended up here and how you ended up at Soko I think this is going to be a great story just because um yeah your background is slightly different from most of the people we had on the podcast so absolutely um again thank you for having me it's a great honor um as you say this is a bit of a daunting thing because i think uh i'm in transition at the moment as you kind of alluded to and maybe that's why i was a bit confused as to <clears throat> what to how to define yeah where you no are. and i think um once a founder always a founder so you can always uh refer to me as a founder of soko but i did step out of the company um after being ceo for about seven years right. um and uh, co-founding the business uh, to start my next business. So I'm in a very much a transition period uh, with Soko, but I can definitely speak to my experience, what, what brought me and led me to founding Soko, and of course, um, what I'm doing next and how all of that is in sort of this, this larger arc of life <laughs> that we've been talking about. Talking about yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. So, so I guess the first question would be, yeah. before we get into your background, maybe define for us what Soko is yeah. so we get some context Absolutely. around that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Soko is largely known as an ethical fashion brand. Uh, we export uh, jewelry, specifically at the moment, uh, women's accessories, so jewelry, into the international market. Um, mm -hmm. And we were founded really on the premise of how do we uh, take the incredible uh, artistry uh, and, and creative capital that we found here in the market in Kenya and really find sort of an external sort of sales opportunity for that. Um, and in Western markets right now, in, in the US and Europe, we found a lot of success with promoting ethical uh, products that are made with people and planet in mind. Um, mm. There's a lot of kind of consumer demand for that product at the moment as well. Mm. So we call them kind of the socially conscious consumer. Um, so Soko, right now when I stepped out of it, we've seen a lot of success. Um, we are currently working with about 2,500 producers mm -hmm. uh, based here around Kenya and Nairobi. Um, and we've been able to sell, uh, this year we're on track to do about $6 million in sales uh, on the platform that's US dollars. Congrats. Um, so good. yeah, it's, it's doing well. And, and that's in seven years? Uh, yeah. Year. So we, we founded in 2012, uh, the organization, mm -hmm. myself, Catherine Mahugu, who's a, my Kenyan co-founder, mm -hmm. um, and Gwendolyn Floyd, who's based out of the US. Wow. Congrats. I mean, that's definitely a success story. Um, and seven years to actually go from zero. Right, absolutely. To six million, yeah. uh, that is not nothing to sneeze at um, in, in in this market specifically, right? Um, because obviously you have to to build everything from scratch. So tell us a little bit about you know maybe you know how you ended up your backstory, right? Education, mm -hmm. blah blah blah, you know and, and that arc, and then how you know your entrepreneurial journey. Were well, you always an entrepreneur from the jump? Or are you selling lemonade on the, on, the, on the corner? Or who are you before Soko? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have largely uh, come from a very creative family and mm. then went through sort of a creative education. So I uh, started out um, in architecture uh, is where I've gotten my undergraduate degree and then later my master's degree from MIT. Um, and I worked in architecture and corporate architecture for a number of years out in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my, I spent 12 years in architecture. Wow. And I came from a family of artists. And so I think that for me that it was uh, very much coming from a 
uh, design background, but I would always say that in architecture I received a degree in problem solving, uh, in systems design and design thinking. And I think that those are very broadly applicable and actually very beneficial to being an entrepreneur. And I, I didn't know that I was an entrepreneur, uh, but I would say that I was always a problem solver and really mm -hmm. enjoyed kind of creating something new from nothing. It was mm -hmm. never about... Um, you know, sort of following the, the standard path. And I would always say that as an entrepreneur, you have to uh, really look at uh, how you're a deviation from the standard. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that we are the counterculture sort of decision makers, and that's why we create new things, mm -hmm. uh, why we create new solutions from what is standard and what others are doing, and, and ultimately why we create new industries and new products in the world. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so from an artist, so to speak, right? And mm -hmm. then what happened next? So 12 years in San Francisco, is that? So 12 that... years in architecture, mm -hmm. uh, three years in San Francisco. So okay. I, I did an undergraduate, four-year undergraduate degree in my home state of Wisconsin uh, in Bachelor of Architecture, then went to San Francisco for three years, worked in corporate architecture with SOM, and then um, went back to graduate school, knowing that I wanted a bit of a change. And so I mm -hmm. went to MIT of all places, which I would say is much more of a... Um, a multidisciplinary school in the mm -hmm. way that they approach kind of more collaborative classes, um, mm -hmm. cross cross programs. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the media lab, um, at the business school, Sloan Business School. There's a lot of external programs, uh, Delta V for entrepreneurship, um, you know, Public Service Center, Legatum Center, um, that were all supportive of kind of more of an entrepreneurial kind of less less of a standard sort of trajectory of, yeah, of yeah. education. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and those things were all the exposure that, that ultimately led me to where I am today. I was able to have a safe space to experiment and to uh, be able to, in a risk-free setting, mm -hmm. really take these ideas and test them in a market and move to Kenya and, and be able to know that there was always a place for me to kind of land softly mm -hmm. if I needed support um, and I needed to be able to 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 ultimately um, ask for help and mm -hmm. I think that's actually one thing that I'm really excited about in our conversations is that how can we create that similar sort of ecosystem uh, mm -hmm. here in Nairobi mm -hmm. yeah that's that's right on point safe space risk mitigated situations yeah, that allow exactly. people to actually explore um, and be creative and, and pursue ideas without um, fear of failure because yeah. ultimately entrepreneurship is all about a path of failing forward mm -hmm, um, and mm -hmm. constantly being being comfortable with that. And mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that as, you know, um, coming from a good education, coming from a background as I have, I think where I have a little bit of a unique perspective, I think, from local entrepreneurship, which mm -hmm. is that um, I have a, a safe landing pad mm -hmm. and I, I want to be able to sort of extend that same and, and space that's, here. And that safe landing pad has got to do with the education. Um, but also, you know, family support, um, mm. and and I think broadly, just um, having an ecosystem, coming from an ecosystem in in the U.S. where entrepreneurship is is held on in high regard, high regard yeah. versus sort of counter to taking a corporate job. Mm, um, mm. And I think that culturally, we have um, a lot of systems that are are in place for us to take out um, loans and to be mm -hmm. able to sort of support. Um, uh, ourselves with, you know, I, I talk about this a lot specifically within technology about how there's a lot of systems that have commoditized starting businesses and made them actually, even just from five years ago till today, right. made it a lot more sort of cost effective yeah. and, and systematic where anyone can prop up a website, anyone can <coughs> can sort of launch a business off of, you know, AWS or mm -hmm. Shopify or mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of using, even tapping into sort of marketing solutions that are that are out there in the space today. You, right. can, you can create a business for less social than 20,000, you know, US dollars. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, use social media for your marketing channels. You don't have to be feet on the ground doing all your marketing anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't have to create a website from scratch you don't even have to have your own sort of server systems like all of those things have been now uh, are, are from a cost perspective and um, complexity also and yeah. complexity things are much more you know frictionless than they right. have been in the past and right. I think that that's the ecosystem that it come from is is how are you reducing those frictions how are you tapping into sort of resources that exist mm -hmm. and I think those things are becoming globally commoditized and actually why entrepreneurship I think is sort of easier, becoming yeah. easier to in the global it. setting as yeah. well yeah. Um, which is why you know Kenya's been an extremely uh, easy place to set up a business actually and I think mm -hmm. this is something that you know, getting into the Soko narrative. Mm. Um, when I first came here, I was still in my master studies, and actually, I created. Um, and uh, before we, we, we yeah, jump please. into, before we get to Nairobi, right? What were the sequence of events that led to? Oh, Nairobi is a place I can go. I don't know if you want to unpack that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I think I had always known that I wanted to live abroad. Mm -hmm. um, I've always had um, this notion that there was a bigger space to play in. And I think for me, that was kind of the global space. It wasn't necessarily Kenya versus, um, versus where I was at in, mm -hmm. in San Francisco, but it was to say that um, I want to solve big problems. I think that's one thing that MIT and actually design thinking uh, degree sort of, sort of set me up for was mm -hmm. that, you know, I, if anything, I am blessed with a great education. I am blessed with all of the tools uh, that someone needs to be successful in creating to make your, the world your canvas that you can paint on so absolutely to speak. Right. and so I have all those tools if anyone's mm. going to do it, mm. it it needs to be me right um, and and not me alone it needs mm. to be a bigger idea than me mm. as an individual it needs mm. to be something frankly I want to put myself towards an idea and, and building something that is bigger than myself and let me ask you this was this obviously architecture was that part of this doesn't sound like an architectural kind of like uh, maybe it is like the, the gene the, yeah. the genesis for an architectural career. Was there a shift at some point in terms of hey wait a minute I want to do absolutely yeah. or was there or, or as an architect did you want to, to build the next Taj Mahal? Where, where where was this kind of thinking? Yeah, I it's interesting because I I think it was absolutely in my corporate. Um, experience that I recognized that it wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted. The one thing they say about architects is that it's the, it's the, um, of all the professional degrees that you can get, it's the lowest paying, That's which true. wasn't my only motivation, but it was also like, it was to the point that it was self-martyrdom. You would work excessive hours and there was, um, you know, success as a, an architect isn't seen until much later in life. The rate mm. of iteration of, you know, you maybe build seven to eight sort of, uh, constructions in your lifetime as well so the that's the, the max the, right? yeah like wow. the rate of because you spend years on on one project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, depending on a, of course what role you're in um, but I, I think for me that that rate of kind of learning and iterating on something was a little bit too slow mm. um, and so for me I was always a little bit at odds with that and so okay. I wanted more of those uh, design designing at a level that actually affected humans and people. But mm -hmm. I but I think as far as a, a degree, it set me up because it was very much, you say it's not like a traditional architect, but architects have to think in urban scale. Mm -hmm. You have to think about the context that you're working in mm -hmm. um, at, at a large sort of social sort of uh, uh, setting. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to be able to think about it in the flashing details of a window. So you have to be able to go and, and combine that into one consistent and, and seamless solution right and so i think that those are kind of the design thinking challenges that i think have led me to sounds like a business what's exactly <laughs> uh, what's the ecosystem like approach to this and then right. also how does that get executed at, at the most micro minutia of right. it as well totally and everything in between right and so we, we we architect engineering solutions we architect uh social systems we architect um in, in many ways sort of the businesses that we build mm -hmm. and i think that all of that has led me to to the success so you had the I framework see. already built in Absolutely. So when you when yeah. you go to MIT and you got exposed to that entrepreneurial ethos, you were like, "This looks Let familiar." Let me apply this now yeah, into yeah. new, into new, much more high, highly iterative, also uh, uh, sort of set of challenges. And right. that for me was much more exciting. Right. And when I started to get the bug of entrepreneurship, I'm like, "This is it. I love this." And, right. and right. let me push into this much more wholly. Awesome. So so now you're in MIT and then Nairobi. How does that? Yeah. <laughs> so I had been talking to a classmate of mine and um, just looking at opportunities to get abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to to go abroad, and it wasn't specifically that I was seeking out Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, and it just so happened that there was another uh, startup in entrepreneurship um, out of the Legatum Center, the entrepreneurship center there. Um, at MIT that was looking for architects to build out actually a sanitation solution based here in Kenya. So I actually okay. came and I was one of the founding members of Sanergy, which is also another sort of MIT-based uh, social enterprise uh, here in Nairobi, which has seen a certain amount of success. Um, so I built their first and designed their first toilet solution, mm. um, which was actually tied to my thesis work that I was doing, which was about methodologies for design to manufacturing, which is, again, kind of how do you build sort of a business around um, you know infrastructure solutions. Mm. It, we can get in. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> but I was looking at CAD CAM technology, and, right. and again, how can technology augment kind of the um, job kali mm. and in sort of um, uplifting the local skill set to be something that could be uh, a larger business? Mm. And so, Synergy was the way to apply that. Um, 
and I effectively was building a precast toilet solutions with them. Mm. I knew I didn't want to be doing that forever. <laughs> building toilets <laughs> and designing does. toilets was not my end game, but it exposed <laughs> me to Kenya. And right. I have to say that for me, it was in my informal time uh, here in Kenya when I was going to the Maasai markets and I was buying up suitcases full of jewelry. Maasai market is amazing. Yes. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, and, and then, you know, taking suitcases full of jewelry back to the United States and seeing that I was making 10, 20 times um, what I was paying for it. Wow. This, this um, is, this is... I could sell it in my family art gallery. So I found that that was, that for me was like, oh, there's a market opportunity here. Right. Um, and... And where was your family's art gallery based? Um, in the Midwest. So this okay. is in Wisconsin. Right? Wisconsin. Yeah, okay. Where I grew up. In and a city or a small town? Small town. My mom's a, a painter. And so, okay. yeah, I think part of this is that Soko in many ways, I'll tell you, was a, an alignment over my lifetime of, you know, my passions in art, uh, combining that to how can technology enable human capital rather than displace it, because we were right. finding that in manufacturing of, of goods and jewelry <laughs> specifically. Um, uh, in the consumer market, you're finding a lot of it's just mass manufactured nowadays. So how do, can you bring art back into... So keep the human being at the center of yeah. production. Bring, it, bring that back in. I mean, look at traditionally what what um, jewelry meant. It was actually, you know, an art form that was meant to express... Expression. Your sort of personal values and, right. and frankly, maybe also personal wealth, if that right. was the value that you wanted to express. But it was very much about telling a story. Right. Um, or even a cultural demonstration. It was almost like, right. almost like Nike now is... People would wear cultural, I mean, you know, art yeah. to represent some kind of a belief system and, or even I, alignment or. And that's coming back loyalty. in with consumers today. And actually, mm -hmm. millennials, much as we millennials get a lot of hack for, for maybe not having, um, uh, being connected to our social media and maybe not having those personal relationships. Actually, millennials are back. the ones that are driving cons conscious consumerism. Okay. They recognize that they want to support brands that align to their values and right. and actually speak to what they what they value in and um, and doesn't force them to compromise. Frankly, right. and we've heard all these incredible stories about you know the Rana Tower collapse in India and the night. Frankly, Nike's gotten a lot of challenge for that in the past, and they've really rebounded from that. What was that again? Well, child labor, and oh, they yeah, were on the yeah, front yeah, of yeah. Time magazine with a, a yeah. child holding a soccer ball. And I think right. that that's the the thing is that they've been able to to really address it head on and say, yeah. you know, from a social risk perspective, we need to respond to the consumers in this and make right. sure that we are socially aligned and consciously aligned to our consumers. And right. they've, they've, they're one brand that really represents that. Right. Um, and Soko was launched with that premise, that if you have an incredible story behind the product, that consumers, yes, they want to buy something that looks beautiful. Definitely. And that's that's the priority, and it has to fit their price point. But they don't want to also compromise on the things that, that they, represent the values that they have. They don't, mm. they don't, they don't want to harm people. They don't want mm. to harm the environment. Um, so it's, the, it's the authenticity well. value chain, I guess supply chain, if you yeah. will, right? The, the consumer wants to be connected not just to the product, but to this whole story, the arc of that product, who it came from, and feel like that's a very interesting kind of, I guess the world has is coming back full circle through millennials to this con conscious, con what would you call it? Conscious you, consumerism. Conscious yeah. consumerism, right? So it's not just the product, it's the holistic thingy about human beings just define it for us a little bit, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, I think that we, we we call it ethical fashion, and I think a lot of people are like, define that. And mm. I think it does mean something different for every person. For mm. us, um, it absolutely means that you can, um, again, we're all, we're all a bit... Uh, <laughs> We want something to look good. We want it to look good yeah. on us. We want it to fit That's a price point. Definitely. But we're saying that we don't want to have to also compromise on on our values. Mm. And I think that so you don't want to, you don't want you don't want child labor being the producer of this. Right. You want somebody on the other side of the production of this who's who is living a dignified life. Yeah. Exactly. And you that's the kind of business you want to be Absolutely. involved in. That's and you want your dollars to represent those values. And right. so how are you voting with every the single dollars. with every single purchase that you mm -hmm. have? You're mm -hmm. voting to represent certain brands over other brands. Right. So 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 
effectively conscious consumerism is very much about the fact that we have this information. We cannot ignore it anymore, right. actually. Right. Incredible journalism, uh, investigative journalism has exposed a lot of this. We're finally having the tools, and actually this is, this is a little bit of a segue and a plug for my next business, but to be able to have transparent supply chains. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This is very something important. that I'm working on is, is, is very much how do, you, how do you bring visibility to supply chains. Um, and now that we have information, after the age of information is the age of choice. And so mm -hmm. how are consumers now using the information that they have? And they have incredible information out there. And with social media, frankly, you're so much more connected to that that, that you can't ignore it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we're finding that consumers are actually pushing brands and larger brands to, to think about this mm -hmm. um, and make this much more of a mainstream conversation. This isn't mm -hmm. just a, a niche, a niche thing, yeah. anymore. It's becoming mainstream. Yeah. And, and so, <clears throat> good. So now you're in Nairobi, you, you, you're starting to kind of ship stuff abroad, you know, maybe twice a, a year. Is that what you're back and forth kind of initial well when I was doing the suitcase business yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was... suitcase of Maasai market stuff that's awesome uh, my Maasai market purchases yes um, and and that was pretty small scale and for me it was a realization that hey I have the education I have the tools to be able to say um, let's make this something right why do I why am I the only one benefiting from this and how do I effectively make a platform right. make a solution that the artisans can see more of the direct benefit from, mm -hmm. from this mm -hmm. market opportunity so mm -hmm. At first, I thought it was just going to be connecting them, connecting those artisans to that consumer base. Mm -hmm. um, and that was sort of the first launch of our business was this Etsy for Africa model. Mm -hmm. um, but very much later, that was very quickly scrapped once we'd sort of exhausted our, our first consumers. Um, so let me ask you this. So yeah. how, how would that, what did that look like? Was it... It was a direct connection. So okay. it was, we were using mobile phones. Um, WhatsApp had, or... What was it? Yeah. We didn't have WhatsApp. Are you kidding me? This is 2012. This was SMS. There was no WhatsApp. This was SMS. SMS and MMS messaging. So we, we proved that actually we could get mobile data up onto the web um, and publish that to a web store. And so artisans were actually able to, from their own personal mobile phone, they were able to upload images and product information through text message and MMS messaging to a web store. Visual files. Visual files that were just displayed on a storefront, much like kind of an Etsy or an Amazon. What was the, what was the, uh, the, the but, richness of the imagery? Did exactly, it? <laughs> this is the challenge. So um, very quickly we realized that um, we actually had to curate that more. So what was this sort of direct connection and this really basic technology actually, mm -hmm. but, but pretty profound in its own right, this mobile to web connection, mm -hmm. uh, this access, I mean, we're, you had to bridge a lot, right? Mm -hmm. You had to bridge not just that technology gap, which we did, and not just the access to that market, but we had to, we learned very quickly, we had to also bridge the aesthetic to what you're saying. How, how does the perceived visual product Look match right. up to the actual right value right, product of, right. of that product. Right. Um, we had to also bridge sort of cultural demands. What were consumers actually wanting versus what was being published um, and what was available? Um, we had to look at um, the ability to effectively match that and that was not there to begin with. So mm -hmm. we actually internalized our, our mobile to web technology and that is now what today we use as our internal ERP solution, which mm -hmm. is a mobile to web virtual resource planning solution. Mm -hmm. um, which, as I started off, Soka is broadly known as this ethical fashion brand because that's what we, we show online now. You have a very curated online web experience like any other web store. Uh, you'll go into retail environments like Nordstrom's, um, Anthropology. You'll find our product there on the shelf like any other sort of jewelry brand. So you have an offline and online yeah. model where yeah. you go through channel stores and partners. Right, but none of that would be possible unless we had really focused ourselves on our back-end technology, which was in, in, in many ways a virtual factory model. It's a distributed manufacturing model. So, um, describe, so, so to, to put, okay. Before we get to the mechanics, you yeah. keep saying we. So talk about how who the we is and how that came about. Because that's always interesting, how co-founders find each other and what they find in each other and how they get aligned and move forward. Yeah. I think that's important. Absolutely. So as I said, Kenya was... When I landed in Kenya, maybe we're, we're skipping around a little bit on my journey here, but when I landed <laughs> in Kenya <laughs> um, and had this exposure within this other business, saw the opportunity uh, in, in this market, um, I decided... I want to build this thing. And mm. I had had an incredible experience. I had found my Kenyan partners on the ground in my work at Synergy were extremely intelligent, mm. uh, very hardworking, and, and 
to be honest, it was a very frictionless environment. At that time, there wasn't a lot of government regulation, to be frank, and we were able to fly under the radar for a very long time Mm -hmm. with regard to kind of the taxation challenges and things Mm -hmm. like that that I think are still a big challenge for entrepreneurs today and, again, part of the ecosystem development that needs to be built. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that, you know, the talent was there. We had incredible engineering talent when when we first started, and my founder was an incredibly intelligent um, sort of... uh, and also a very culturally aware uh, partner who helped kind of um, make sure that our solution was augmented and appropriate to the local population. Here's her name? So Catherine Mahugo, oh, I met her while I was at the University that, yeah. of Nairobi. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was actually, had been taking a, um, a course with Stanford's uh, basically uh, ICT for D um, development mm. technology course mm. um, and they were doing a lecture series and so she and I had met on campus okay. actually related to that and I had mm. been teaching a course through my localized design manufacturer in University of Nairobi so we were kind of rubbing shoulders a little bit mm. um, but she was a really great engineer uh, and an even better manager mm. of engineers mm. um, and so we started the business together did an early proof of concept with this mobile uh, to web sort of technology and then we, we launched the business with, with just friends and family as our customers. And that was sort of our first proof point. Um, and then we internalized that. And so when I say we, I actually mean our broader team. Okay. I think it was, yeah. for me, it was, um, <clears throat> right now, I, th- I have to say that I'm very proud that when I stepped out of Soko, we're 100% African team. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I didn't find a replacement for myself to, mm-hmm. to sort of take over the CEO role. Mm-hmm. Who's um, the CEO right now? Um, so we have a CEO b- based out of the U.S. Mm. now because mm. we need to build the brand. Yep, yeah, yeah. you have a, um, need to have a face there because that's your market essentially. That is our market, right. but but our COO is based here right. in Kenya. Makes our sense. CTO is based here in Kenya. Our right. CIO is based here in Kenya. Our CFO is based here in Kenya. So our yeah, entire well, C's, the whole executive our, team, yeah, the, the executive team, the people who are building the business and managing the, the trust, business, yeah. mm-hmm. they are all. Our African-led mm-hmm. and African-based team here in mm-hmm. Nairobi. Mm-hmm. So. That's great. I mean, this is kind of a uh, counterpoint to the recent IPO, right? I'm sure you had the the furor that followed the Jumia listing, true. <laughs> <laughs> where everybody yeah. was it's a, a C. Bit unfortunate was, to call itself an African business, yeah, and yet it's yeah, not. Yeah, maybe African consumers, but uh, not built by and from the Africans. Yeah, I think it's just uh, it's interesting. I mean, how. What, what's your perspective on that? I mean, do you, did you see the CEO on um, CNBC talk about how... Did you see that clip? I didn't, but I've heard... Uh, I've heard, actually, I know one of the investors that mm-hmm. invested mm-hmm. in, mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. Jumia, and mm-hmm. so I have a little bit of some back information. <laughs> I don't know that I should be Still putting it on the <laughs> Say what you can. <laughs> um, but no, I think I think what's publicly available is, is also just really interesting. And I think from a public dialogue, um, I mean, you and I have talked about this a little bit. Mm-hmm. You're in, in Kenyan born, but let's be honest, you've been away for a long time as well. And so mm-hmm. I say I say I'm, I'm African in I'm American in mindset, but African in soul. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. It's not about me. Tell, tell, tell us about what, what your thoughts are, where you were going with this. Yeah, and, uh, and let me just say from my own personal experience, I, I'm constantly challenging myself as sort of a foreigner mm-hmm. um, with, let me say, two Kenyan sons now that, you know, I challenge myself every day to think uh, as much as I can about sort of the cultural, my cultural sort of st- standing mm-hmm. and where I am and to mm-hmm. be sensitive to that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and at every opportunity, make sure that I'm not um, overstepping it's, sort of it's, my it's, value. It's, it's, a very, it's a fine balance, right? We live in this very complex world, right? Where mm-hmm. there's narrative and precedent and structure that we kind of are born into. And a lot of times, you know, just being, just being a human being is complex enough without thinking about these whole, whole, all these other winds that are behind us or in front mm-hmm. of us or whatever it is. So I'm, I'm totally sensitive to that. I, um, I think we all we all struggle with that. Mm-hmm. I guess um, one of the things that um, I appreciate about you is is that level of consciousness that you bring to the conversation. And you you told me one thing when we were one of our conversations <laughs> that uh, you know Western people right either come here for one of two reasons. <laughs> this was You're gonna quote me on this. I'm gonna you on this. I know where you're going. <laughs> it was like either as Savior, mind, savior mindset? Savior complex. Savior complex. Or escapism. Or escapism. And I thought this was so... So now every time I go somewhere, I'm like, 
what is this person representing? <laughs> See, you messed but me I, up. But I said this with the premise of... But I'm not either of them. No, you're not either of them, obviously. You, I mean, you, you, can, you can see it and Of course, all of us consider ourselves neither of those. Um, right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's dope. But, um, but anyway, let's, let's kind of move forward with... So you have you put together this team, you put together proof of concept. From zero to proof of concept, from suitcase in Wisconsin <laughs> to this web store, the first yeah. version one, what was that timeline, I guess, when you and your co-founder decided we're going to build something? Yeah, I mean, we so we initially just had grants. We had you know university uh, business plan grants. So we built sort of that MVP in a very like very short succession. Um, keep in mind, I was still at school, and she was also still at school. So it was you know, part time, kind mm-hmm. of a side hustle. Um, it was our passion project, mm-hmm. um, but it mm-hmm. wasn't something that was real. Um, at first, um, we did a demo Africa competition actually, which was when we launched our web store. Nice. Um, and that was in October. By end of December, three months later, we knew that we had to pivot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so you had to pivot from very, this Etsy marketplace model? Yeah, we knew that it wasn't going to work. Okay. Because we knew it was far too expensive to bring in the customers, and that, that as I mentioned, that perceived. Uh, value versus actual value was was far too misaligned. Just because the pictures were not representative or because what was the issue there? Well, to be frank, uh, people in the U.S. didn't want to buy a necklace with an Africa on it, a brass Africa pendant. You know, that was... That's not something they could relate to. You buy it when you're here because you're a tourist and and there's a story behind it. But when you're in the U.S., we're like, we need to tap into mainstream consumers here to have this be of any value to, to the producer groups. So the product... Uh, options, choices, cues. We had to curate. We had to, so we very quickly, what we did is we launched our own brand, uh, which is now the Soko Brands. Nice. The platform in its own right actually was not branded Soko at first. Soko is the brand that we launched, where what we did is we curated products. Uh, Curated products means that you have to, um, we had to do the photography. We had to do the product descriptions of those. As soon as you invest someone's time to take a product photo, edit that photo, put that up, put a product description on it, price it accurately. Now you need to be selling multiples. It doesn't make sense for you to be selling one-off one, pieces. One. Oh. So then we started selling in multiples. So then now we start getting into the production business. Got it. So now we have inventory that we're stocking um, and we're starting to sell actually more business to business because that's when you sell volume. Mm-hmm. Um, so we launched this brand and, and actually we saw a lot of success very what, so early what, on in that. So that, I mean, going from, you know, a marketplace model of, of stuff that you just throw on to this news it's almost like a, it's such a leap i mean what was there a sequencing of this or did you guys just all of a sudden say we're gonna pivot and be this yeah i mean i think one one thing that i'd say about my entrepreneurship journey is i've learned a lot of lessons along the way um one of them is never to be i, I think again we weren't led by a product we weren't saying oh we want to be the etsy for africa we we also didn't have a technology that we were trying to fit into a market solution and find a customer for. We had a problem that we wanted to solve, which is awesome. how do I bring more work to this artisan population that has the creative capital and has this incredible skill and product? And, and frankly, are underrepresented and undervalued in the global consumer market. And that was what we wanted to solve. So the product wasn't an end game. Right. Our end game and our motivations and our mission, frankly, was never, was never changing. Uh, even though our product and, and how we're representing this is so important. to the world was, was changing. This is so important. I mean, you basically wanted to give Maasai market, you wanted to yeah. bring the Maasai market to the world, create like a connection. It wasn't about the, 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 the bits and bytes or kind of any kind of uh, model that you're trying to fit in. Right. You were trying to solve this problem okay. of, uh, I guess, what's the term I'm looking for here? But yeah, I, I totally get it. You're basically trying to elevate people's lives, in a sense. The goal Very was mission driven. The goal was to create economic opportunity and financial inclusion for a, a segment of marginalized artisans that I felt like had incredible skill and a beautiful product that wasn't getting the access in the market That's that it awesome. deserved. So you see that problem, and you're like. We how can do we solve, solve this? How do we solve this problem? And and therefore the technology and the business solution that we eventually landed on, and and, and ultimately actually we, we we have continued to pivot mm-hmm. because from that model of launching our own brand, what we did is we did curated products. We actually found products in the market that we felt like were were good products, mm-hmm. but we kept even pivoting away from that. We learned later that actually African designs weren't necessarily. 
we thought at first we needed to maintain the artisan's um, sort of desire to design and sell African aesthetic. And, and we eventually even pivoted away from that by hiring designers in the U.S. that designed to the market that we wanted to sell into because we had conversations with artisans that said, hey, you know, like, we love that you want to represent our heritage and our design on your website, but ultimately tell us what to make that's going to make money because ultimately our motivation is to, to feed our money. children and to make money. Hello. <laughs> and so we're like, great, let's, let's do that. So How we, did that conversation come about? That's so interesting. That yeah. What... what what, how did that come about? Did somebody reach out and say, hey, I don't know, I've run out of designs? <laughs> no, I think it was, it was that they were seeing success um, with us doing slight modifications. Like we would, uh, we, it was a progression. I wouldn't say this was like an epiphany moment by mm, any means, but mm. when we went to validate it with mm. producers and we said, hey, you know, these are the designs that are selling and, and they're saying, hey, my designs aren't selling on your platform. I see my neighbors making better money than I am. Tell me what to do. How Got can it. I? How okay. can I actually make more money? Be more successful. Yeah, with, at this? with your platform. Yeah, I mean. So I, your artisans were coming and kind of looking over the, at their colleagues, or. Yeah, I mean they're all neighbors to each other. I right, mean, this right, is, this right. This is from Hawker's Market in in uh, at Toy Market rather, and Hawker's Market in in Kibera, um, two sort of rural communities, but they all know each other. Right. You know, totally. They're all. It's an ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. And so, do you have any specific stories of anybody in that? journey, any one of your artisans whose life was transformed through this or their business grew or oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. tell us. That's, something. I mean, that's the exciting stuff that's right the, That's there. the cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think for me, well, let me just say that there's a lot of points of pride, which is that even our first employees have transformed their lives. Like for me, the mission of the business was to empower people mm -hmm. and it was to use technology, use <clears throat> the skills that I had available. So great education mm -hmm. with the ability to build and use technology and access to technology. I said, how do we use those things? And access to markets, right? The connections. And access to markets. I'm networks. a foreigner. Like yeah. that's, that's the part that I bring to the table. Right. Um, I know what that consumer wants. Um, and so I can, I can offer those things up. Um, so building a solution that, that could benefit the artisans. But I think that for any mm -hmm. entrepreneur, you also have to be authentic to how you then treat your team mm -hmm. internally. And so for me, when you ask me what are the things that I'm prou most proud of, it's actually in employing 100 people. Wow. Um, it's that's, that's exciting. And also supporting the production and, and businesses of 2,500 artisans. But it is, it's our, my internal team. We have to have an authentic mission of empowering people through technology that reaches our artisan community. Absolutely, there has to be a problem solved in the market. Right. But ultimately, there has to be an authentic connection to that, also to how you build and manage your team, which is about empowering people, and specifically from the African continent, in, in our business. Right. Um, and yeah. that's our brand, and that's that's ultimately what we are thinking. Any stories? Yeah. Any, any, any artisan so, that you think that you, for you was just so poignant and yeah. hit home and you're like, this is why I'm doing it for well, this Well, let person. me just say, that, like, the number of babies that have been born because of the... <laughs> babies are going to be born in Africa. Whether... I know, but, like, being named after, you know, our team members and things like that, that's that's really exciting for mm -hmm. me. Um, I mean, we... we I, I would tell the story of, of Victoria because... Um, or she's an incredible ex story of someone who started out as just, uh, she was actually the, the sort of um, uh, assistant to, to the sort of production teams. And she was working out of a bone factory in... Bone? Bone factory. Okay. In Kibera. Mm. Um, and so she, we'd walk in and she would be the assistant. She'd be the one that would greet you at the door and she was you okay. know, helping to effectively just... Um, like, a, like an office admin kind of thing? An admin, that's a perfect... Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was looking for the term. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, she was an admin and um, ultimately what was interesting is she found that in her free time she would take the products that were being produced by the, the manufacturing team and she would start assembling stuff. On her um, own? On her own. With the, with, with the kind of like, uh, I guess, yeah. the... Not the main production raw this material? Isn't, this was not part of the core business. They okay. were producing for clients on okay. demand, okay. designs that were designed by, by you know external sort of parties. But she came into it with, hey, I have time on my hands. Let me just take the materials that are available. And she started assembling stuff. And actually, her designs were really beautiful. So one day, one of our team members just went in, saw some of her designs, and were like, you know, you actually have talent. You have an eye for quality. You have an eye for sort of consistency. Um, let's hire you. Let's 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 actually sell some of your products with some slight modifications and actually so she was part of our early launch of of that product mm -hmm. um and has 
maintained with us an incredible relationship. So she went from being an assistant inside a workshop, making 10,000 Kenyan shillings a month, um, to within selling her own designs, she was making 80,000 in a month. And now uh, she's learned new skills. So she's, not, she's no longer just doing assembly of bone work and being in a bone factory. Uh, she was part of our women's initiative to do soldering, introducing soldering skills uh, with not welding equipment, but like very fine detailed uh, soldering equipment that we imported. Mm -hmm. She was part of that first 12 women um, that we trained in that skill set. So she's now doing metal work and she's one of the best that we've seen. And she's making, you know, uh, a very healthy, you know, salary. And this um, is in how many? Not salary, but, but income. Right. How, this is in how, how long? What was the trans? Timeline we're talking Literally from. within a matter of three months, you saw her go from 10,000 to you know 80,000 um, income, and we see that consistently across our yeah. Yeah, and consistently across our platform, three to five x right. within the first few months of right. starting with us. And right now, where is she at? Is she like she's like three times. What, so she's what been she? able to move her family out of Kibera. They now live in an estate with proper running water, and she sends us you know her younger siblings to school. She's bought her mom this a first so cook awesome. stove. You know, I think like all of these things are, are you know, I speak to about one person, but like I love these change. are yeah. yeah, these are the things that and and I what I love about Soko in the way that we built our business is that we didn't want to bring these artisans into a single factory where they're just getting a daily wage and a salary. It's legitimately the work that you put in is the output that you get. So it was entrepreneurial top to bottom. So one right? to yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we're, we're employing independent entrepreneurs who have authority and ownership in their own story. That's, that's the way to do business. Yeah, I mean, it's because very dignified. She takes full credit for all that success. That is not on us right. paying her a salary. That is 100% <sighs> awesome. on her and taking the opportunity that was put in front of her. But the more that you can sort of create that sort of multiplier and and help people to sort of see their own ownership. Right, seize their destiny in a sense, yeah. right? And to be honest, we've benefited from that too because the level of quality that we get, oh, yeah. the timelines of people delivering on time because they take ownership and pride. They're not employees, they're producers yes. in a very real sense. Like yes. their work effort is tied their income is tied to their level to their of effort and yeah. quality that they produce. Yes. I love it. And, and you know, yeah, that's great. I mean, I don't even want to take that. After that, I'm so excited. Because yeah. for me, the reason I, 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 I love uh, entrepreneurship and, you know, innovation-driven entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. as Bill Ouellette talks about the whole time, it's different than traditional, quote-unquote, entrepreneurship, is this multiplier effect, right, mm -hmm. of bringing markets together, driving... Um, uh, instilling efficiency and, and it's just a different thing Absolutely. altogether right well and i think this is where i i say technology has the ability to transform markets because i think that also i would say that how that affects our team and if i can tell you now a sure. story about someone inside our, uh, inside our team i love stories yeah is that we've been able to take then artisans that we've recognized that had a lot of talent that were maybe we'd hire them casually to do some packaging here and there because there were youth right. that were apprentices in a workshop and we saw that they were clever but they didn't have any formal training and we'd say, hey, you know, come in. Uh, we, we recognize that you're, you're actually, you're something special. You, right. you work hard. Right. You ask the right questions. Um, you're not, this isn't just you seeing this as a day wage, mm -hmm. right? Like there's something, there's something special about you. Yeah. And, that, and we come across these individuals a lot, mm -hmm. recognizing that talent and saying, hey, like come inside our team. Um, and so we've actually been able to, through technology, uh, make very easy, seamless processes where, frankly, someone that's technically low skill can take this up and do the job. Mm -hmm. We don't have to hire someone who's coming in with a high degree to manage the production. We actually hire people from the community that we want to target um, and use technology to sort of augment their sort of, you know, willingness or desire or, or sort of need to make sort of hard decisions or sort of complex Excel spreadsheets to sort of seamlessly, you know, sort of uh, manage sort of the production timelines, things like that. They don't have to have those skills, but they have the people skills, they have the cultural sort of knowledge, they have um, so other things that sort of benefit the system, and we tie that into our technology, and we can employ an extremely low skill um, but highly capable um, sort of uh, uh, base of of field managers and an operations team. And, and so an example in terms of what this means in terms of individual change again, right? If you could put some kind of... Yeah. A... Well, I mean, I think we're, we're talking about individuals, youth, who mm -hmm. went from being completely unemployed mm -hmm. to 
um, you know, living in a, a family member's, you know, house to being able to live on their own, uh, take in a salary and, and go back for higher education. Um, I, I, I think that um, Verilyn is, is probably my, my favorite story in this. Verilyn? Verilyn. That's an interesting name. <laughs> Vero. Yeah. Um, because she was someone that you just knew looking at her, she had that spark in her eye mm. where she had the intellect mm. to do more, mm. but she didn't have any of the opportunities. Mm. Um, she didn't have the family members to be able to, to provide her mm. access to a job. Mm. Uh, she didn't have the wherewithal and the capital to be able to go for uh, an education. Mm. So her choices were very limited, mm. but she took what was there and she took a casual day job with us and again, someone who worked hard in that moment and we recognized the ability and we tied her up into our system and she went from being sort of a casual worker inside SoCo to having an associate job to now managing actually a department within the organization and that's training awesome. other people. That's awesome. And I think that's something that we all look for, right? Is <clears throat> right. That going from even entrepreneurship, they say Africa actually has the highest rate of entrepreneurship per capita of any continent. Mm. But it's needs-based entrepreneurship. It's needs-based. Let's, let's be real, right? It's needs-based. I survive, need to put food on the table. <laughs> what do I have? Shit. I can sell. I can sell some tomatoes. Right. Um, that That's I. That's not even. Is that even real entrepreneurship? That's is, not entrepreneurship. It is technically entrepreneurship, but it's, it is needs-based. I, I think it's 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 it needs another term because in my view, entrepreneurship yeah. is. I guess maybe it is because so, it is. so it's needs based entrepreneurship, and I okay. think by comparison, which is I think what we we need the perspective on right. is 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 the ability to employ other people. When you have entrepreneurship where you can employ people in a business that you've created, or give op give others opportunity. Give others opportunity right. because that, employing is one dimensional. Like you guys don't employ the artisans; they're not your employees. Right, that's true. Right, yeah, that's true. it's it's expand. It's an it's an inclusive approach to whatever you're building, right? Whatever I'm doing, like, you know, Ray Kroc, you yeah. know, and the franchising thing, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, but I think to that point, peop other people are getting opportunities from what you've created. Totally. Right, and That's so it. whether we call it entrepreneurship or we call it, you know, ecosystem development, I think there's, you know, and of course, again, with technology, it's much, much more kind of harder to define, much more uh, loose boundaries there. Um, and I think that that's something that, again, when someone goes from being self-serving and trying to uh, just get food on the table and, and get beyond sort of that survival mode mm -hmm. to now managing other people and training them to do the same. Oh, the like, transformation that's, is that's massive. Super exciting. Yeah, they start to self-actualize. They're going up uh, Maslow's hierarchy here. Exactly. And that's, that's what life is about. At the end of the day, this whole game is about human well-being. Mm -hmm. And we, we were having this conversation earlier today about happiness versus joy, right? You can be happy and you can make money and be happy, quote unquote, but that's very ephemeral. It goes up and down. It's, it doesn't Serving stay. the ego. Right? It's an it's a ego-driven thing. It's a thing. consumption thing. If I have that job, if I have that, that, that better paying money, if I build my family, you know, like if I have the right car, right. Um, there's sort of an acquisition element to happiness. Right. If I have this thing. It's about me. It's about me, 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 me. Yeah, and which all of us we need to reach happiness. All of us need to acquire things to a certain extent. I'm, you know, I, but I, you need to get beyond that. You need to get beyond that. Yeah, I, I think. I, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, but ultimately, yeah. I mean, there's no other better way to put it. You yeah. need to actually. The human journey is about inclusion, mm -hmm. right? It's about how do I make the world better around me, mm -hmm. right? In a very real, material way, and once you get into that mode. It's, it's like a drug, man. I mean, it's, yeah. it's why we're here, I think, you know. Well, and I think for, for, for the listeners, I think it's worth kind of repeating maybe what um, we, we said a little bit, which is that there's kind of this, the two mountain people. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. you have, yeah. um, you, you reach and attain all the goals that you've set for yourself. Um, and I, I, I would say for most people, let's just say they reach a certain, they reach beyond survival mode, mm -hmm. right? You, mm -hmm. And survival mode is a big thing in our market. And because it's, the, the reality of the situation, the average person listening to this is just trying to survive, Goodbye, is trying to make yeah. it, is just trying to... So maybe some of the stuff we're talking about is too, like, they can kind of theoretically think about it, but it's not real to them in a yeah. sense. But, you know, I mean... And I, I think that's that's step one. I mean, how can we get to a place where where you're not struggling anymore? Because then you're in a position where you're full. Yep. And so I, I'd say everyone does need to reach happiness. Everyone right. does need to reach a place where you are full. Because when you're full, now you can give. You're but, overflowing, right? right but and I, so, I, sorry, go ahead. So the way that, that, that I guess I look at it, and I, I definitely want to hear your perspective mm -hmm. on this, is that 
but happiness can be achieved much sooner than acquisition of things. And, and us trying to chase what we believe is happiness or looking at external sort of forces validation. or societal validation or, mm. or family pressures that you need these things to be happy. It's about recognizing when you reach that point where you're full and you can start to give back and recognizing also what you've achieved, the education that you've gotten, um, the access uh, and experiences that you've attained and recognizing that actually, okay, I have a little bit to give back now. And, and I think that that's the, that's the double mountain theory is that, that you can chase happiness. You can continue to acquire skills and continue to acquire Quite things. things and, um, yeah. But recognizing that there is something greater than that, which is actually service. Yeah. And that through service, you achieve joy. Right. And so the, the, the double mountain, the second mountain in the double mountain is that you recognize that actually um, happiness isn't, isn't the end game, but joy is the end game. And that we, we achieve joy by having those social connections outside of my own self-acquisition. But what is my contribution to society totally. at, at large? And mm -hmm. that actually that, when you can reach joy and you can give back and you can employ people in your community and you can create something that improves people's lives, that is, is true success in right. my mind. And you know what? I mean, a couple of things I'll say here. So if you look at somebody like, uh, I'll take the quintessential example, right? We talked about this, Bill Gates, right? Mm -hmm. His first mountain was Microsoft, massive mountain. But he, 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 I guess, evolved beyond that, or, or, or once he was done with the, that, it was now this other thing, like how can I actually change the world? How can I be part of an inclusive approach to improving human well-being? Mm -hmm. So that's what he's about right now. So that he's a classic, classical double mountain person. Is that how you, how you define it? And the other thing to it, one of the things, I, 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 this, is, this is a very important topic because in our particular society in, in, in Kenya, there's, there, you could generally say, we're, in general, most people, even when they make it, it's still always about, that's the mountain I'm going to stand on. This is, this is it. Very few people make the transition to where I'm going to make impact. And you know, an interesting thing is you almost see it with people who are, in a sense, more kind of like people who live in coming out of the slums or people who have, who have experienced uh, suffering or, or, or a hard life, they tend to make that transition much faster, much easier, much quicker. Yeah. Or maybe they don't even have this double mountain thing. They just go on that bigger mountain, that second mountain right service. off the bat. You see service in, a, in the lower uh, level of society, so to speak, for want of a better definition. I am frustrated by, you know, my peers, right, who in a lot of ways, some of them, are, they, they still are not making that transition. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, and I don't know why that is. I mean, I... I well, I think we, we live in a world also where there's these tropes that like, oh, if I just employ people, that's service. And I think to some degree that's true, but I think it goes beyond that. You know, I, I think that we need to recognize that um, there's, there's the ability in everyone's business to have a purpose and a meaning beyond just selling a product or sort of acquiring something. I think that we... And, and I, don't, I don't think we mean to judge, right? We're trying to understand, mm -hmm. like, what's the mm -hmm. psychological framework that, mm -hmm. that sort of leads people down this path? And I would say entrepreneurs are maybe uh, individuals who I would say have, have gone off that path, in, by and large, that, to what you're saying. They're not just seeking a job. They're not just um, managing mm -hmm. uh, a family business. They're maybe entrepreneuring within a larger corporation. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that this, you have to sort of start your own thing. But, but those that are trying to solve problems and bring true value creation to the market, I think those generally there's more enlightenment to that. You have to have a little bit of more sort of self-reflection about service. You want to solve a problem for people. You want to be able to um, create something that actually has impact in the world and, and make that not just about how can I make money, mm. but solving a real problem. And but, but here's the other thing too. To there's two yeah. sides to that. There's the product. You can create a product. A lot of times what people also miss is the internals of your company. Is your company also a vehicle for transformation in itself, right? Yeah. What you've done with your people. Yeah. And that is another missing, missing link. And I believe going forward, especially in a, in a vision-driven world, mm -hmm. it's about talent and it's about tapping into Absolutely. people's capabilities and getting them engaged. We come from a society where people hired bodies and mm -hmm. we still have this very kind of, let me get the cheapest I can get in terms of labor. We still have this labor mindset mm -hmm. in terms of the entrepreneurs the people who are, that's not going to cut it anymore. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I mean, we're in this world where the internals of your, of your culture 
And what you define, what you do, is very much linked to the, to the quality of the problem you're going to solve out in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we're, we're still not there yet, here in a large way. Even in the States, you know, I think, I think um, different regions have a different relationship with this, right? But, you know, maybe you, you could maybe give us some geographical maybe yeah. perspective, or am I wrong, or what do you think? So, I mean, I think that the, 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 co the core premise of your question is, is, I think, right, which is to say that um, is there sort of an awareness for, but I think it is a luxury. Is there an awareness for the, the good that you're, that you're sort of putting into the world or, or frankly, like the do no harm? I think a lot of people need to start with that, to be frank, that there's this mentality of do no harm. Um, I think within my own personal journey, and that's what I can speak to, is is when when did I recognize? And I would say a lot of this is easy to talk to because I can I can look back and I can say, you know, post rationalization a little bit here that look what we did, mm. we built people. Mm. Um, and I would say that a lot of that is is sort of intrinsic to to that leadership, and not just my own leadership, but the leadership that we that we hired and the people that we met. And I have to say that like all of them I hired from the beginning were problem solvers. Mm. Mm. No one was skilled at what they did. There mm. wasn't sort of an acquisition of labor. It was hiring problem solvers and people that could think critically. Mm. But none of them were specifically talented at in any... In one way or another. I mean, our COO came out of a, a conflict resolution background, you mm. know, and that, mm. that was, you know, not a necessarily a tangible mm. skill, but it's come <laughs> in a lot, you know, come in handy. Mm. Um, but I think it's like, when do you sort of recognize... Um, that you have this this bigger influence, and I would say that I had incredible partners in my business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my CEO, in particular, Kotsunai Matirke, who pushed me also to recognize. It, it's sometimes hard to self reflect, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to post rationalize what you've done, but in the moment when you're just trying to get by, it's just hard. trying to make it succeed, right. just trying to kind of get to the next level, it is really hard to it's recognize really hard. that. It's really hard. You know, this but, but sorry. it's being in touch with with your authentic self, and mm -hmm. I think. We talk about this too is, you know, first start with no harm, I tell people, but then understand and, and actually you, you feel it. You feel when you are, you have those, there's moments when you walk into, I would walk into the office and I'd say, wow, you know. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than me. I'm, yes, helping to employ these people and there's a lot of pressure there to, to make sure that this business succeeds, so that, that these people have a job at the end of the day. But ultimately, they are helping me to build it alongside right, me. Right, and, and right. We're in this together. Yeah. And you said the key thing, building people. This entrepreneurship at its, at its core, successful entrepreneurship, honestly, the one that delivers joy and the one that transcends mm -hmm. is really about building people. And, you know, to me, that is fundamentally what I believe the future is about. Mm -hmm. Because technology are going to replace a lot of things that you know, mechanical things or repeatable tasks. But I really believe that the companies that are going to transcend, like Soko, for example, I mean, going from zero to six million, that's, you build people. That's why that happened. Absolutely, it wouldn't happen without. No way, right? Everyone in that value chain. Right. Everyone right. had to be aligned. Right. And then the other thing too is recognizing the inherent genius in people. Right? Not, you're trying to fill a specific role, but you know, you can see this person has that spark in their eye. I want that kind of person around me. Well, you have to tap into, and I think we, we all have, we all have to be heroes in our own personal story. I was listening to the Reed Hoffman. That's a, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> I yeah. loved his, yeah. his interpretation of this, which is like, how do you, also you know, with your customers, how do you make sure that they're heroes in their own story? But like, you know, how do you solve a real problem? But I also think this is very true of your team. And I think making sure that we are all successful is, is, a, is, is extremely important. Um, and, and yeah, I think that building people is, it, no business would be successful unless you're able to align your company's vision to a person's internal totally. personal goals. Totally. And so, you know, you talk about HR and you talk about like, do we really need an HR manager? Do we need a professional development and, and sort of roadmap for our teams? Specifically in Kenya, I would say, where people are very motivated for per personal development. I mm. think that's something that's very unique to this culture. Mm. I think you do. Mm. You need that from day one. Mm -hmm. And you need to make sure that your core team, your first sort of employees, as well as your last employees, all have a plan where their personal goals are aligning to totally. the company goals. Clarity. Yeah. And, and, and knowing that from day one. Right. Because if you 
If you don't have that, then you're going to have very transactional Ton employees. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Trend, and that might be okay in certain businesses or certain roles, like the casual roles. Mm -hmm. But I think that when, particularly your purpose-driven organization, which, which Soko was, and I would say a lot of, you know, much more broadly than just ethical fashion, you mm -hmm. can have purpose in what you're doing. Um, just making sure that people know, even if it's for two years that you're with this company right. and your goal is to get to, to graduate school. Right. You want to do a master's degree and you need to make some money and you need to have some experiences. Let's make sure that we give you some experiences, but in return, we want you to put yourself towards this particular, uh, uh, mission. Right. And you know, there's different types of employees. You right. can have those employees that are just career driven mm -hmm. and then you can have those that are our leaders mm -hmm. and actually thinkers within the organization. Mm -hmm. I would say any startup, any any entrepreneur that's out there, you cannot have employees that are just there for, for a daily wage. No way. No you way. have to have people that are more career oriented yeah. and, and looking for, um, looking to sort of climb a ladder with you right. and through you Tro uh, totally. as an organization. Totally. But, but you also have to be transactional. You also have to make sure people are paid fairly and there's the element yeah. of it. But you have to align interests. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't see them as, as any kind of uh, dis divorced in any sense. Yeah. Right? Because if you know, you got to take care of people's need, short term needs along with their long-term needs. I mean, yeah. how, how could you not, you know? Yeah. Um, and look, I think we're we are, we are, we are at the end here. There was, there's so much we could talk talk about. There's some Absolutely. questions I would have asked, but I'm not going to get to. Um, but this is very en enlightening. I guess final parting shots in terms of tips for uh, entrepreneurs, um, employers, any, anything that you want to give in terms of words of yeah. wisdom from you. From, oh, I guess the best way is what are some of the key takeaways or lessons you learned from building Soccer? Maybe that. Yeah, um, I mean, there's so many. Obviously, this the, <laughs> we, we've already Top had three. hours of conversation right. around this stuff. Um, but I would say one thing that I that I would I would say has been a really good framework for me to think, and and actually helped me to make decisions much more quickly about who to hire and what decisions to make around sort of you know resource management and and even you know, building the company. I think came to sort of um, understanding my business and, and why it stood. And I think that they, this is actually not my own thing. This is from Jim Collins. Um, he wrote Built to Last good to, and then Good, good to Great. great yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the hedgehog theory. And I think that this is something that I went back to a lot mm -hmm. because it helped me not just in building the business, but the people. Mm -hmm. And it was about having a passion. What is your purpose of your business? And this is what's the problem that you're solving. But frankly, what is that thing that gets you excited? Mm -hmm. What's that thing that is 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 your passion that, that makes you want to get up and, and do this every single day because there's gonna be hard days mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when the money's not there mm -hmm. when when someone calls in sick and or, or quits on you and right. right before a big delivery I mm. mean there are gonna be extremely hard moments in the entrepreneurial journey but if you have that purpose I, I'd say that 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 helps you actually it, it's great to rely on purpose when things are bad let me just say that <laughs> <laughs> when things are good you know what there, there's People things are, are paid well, no one's complaining, but when things go bad, that purpose has to be there. Mm -hmm. And and I think for me, that was one thing that I don't think I necessarily realized that I was doing that and starting Soko in the beginning, mm -hmm. but there were so many times in those hard moments where that got me through. Mm -hmm. And entrepreneurship is all about not giving up. You're failing mm -hmm. every step of the way and you mm -hmm. just can't give up. Mm -hmm. You have to be the last one standing when all your competition falls off and mm -hmm. gives up. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's really what it's about. So what was your purpose again? Just to reiterate so, the So yeah, I mean, I think Soko's purpose was about empowering people. I think for me, it was how do I use my own personal skills? I was the hero of my journey by solving a hard problem, which is to say that what, what do I have to offer and how can that empower other people? And that mm -hmm. was for me using technology and systems design to empower human capital, That's using awesome. technology to empower people, not displace them. Um, and that was for me the, the problem that I, in, in fact, continue to want to solve in my life. Yeah, it is, um, it is, it is a great opportunity of our time in a very real way. Yeah, and I right. think that if you have the skills to be able to lend towards that, there's so much purpose and meaning in that. Yeah. Um, but also for me, I would say that there was in Soko also a little bit of that, that passion around artistry because mm. I came from a family of artists. My mom's a painter, my dad's a musician. Um, and I grew up around artists in our household. I don't know how many drum sessions I was a part of as a kid. Um, and for me, it was, you know, it was something that I saw the ability to to empower people through their craft and through creation and through mm. dignified employment, that was something that was was a huge driver. So that was that was the cornerstone mm -hmm. of what founding Soko was all about. Um, and then the other sort of three 
so it's purpose, it's also profits, and mm -hmm. then it's about differentiation. So mm -hmm. how do you make your money is the second pillar of that, right. and mm -hmm. that's the business model. Right. We we saw a market opportunity, and we saw you know sort of a, a gap between sort of uh, incredible products that needed to be sold and a market that was willing to buy them. So that was the Soko brand. That was how we that was our economic driver, mm -hmm. and then we had um, sort of our a differentiation, and that mm -hmm. was our technology, mm -hmm. being able to sort of build something more efficiently. Um, and and I think being able to constantly think through sort of what is your what's your passion what's your economic driver and what's your differentiation um, and in that you're gonna find the thing that is uniquely you there's gonna be other people who have the same passion and maybe have the same market but if you don't have that differentiation you're gonna fail yeah. you know you, yeah. you're not you're not unique in the way that you're doing it yeah. you can also have your uniqueness you can build an incredible product and you can have a passion behind that but if you don't have a market to be able to sell business that model, yeah. business model around it you, you can also fail so i think right. just making sure that there's alignment also between your purpose and your business um and those were the things for me that you know again when, when times get tough you had to lean back on that quite right. a bit. awesome so, thank you so much yeah. for taking the time to do this this has been a good one thank you for having me <laughs>